Hello! In this video, I would like to take a look at how sound on Linux works, and how all the different pieces that you might have heard of like ALSA or OSS or Pulse Audio and Jack come together to form the complete Linux audio ecosystem. First, let's start with the basic hardware. The whole point of the sound system is to be able to interact with physical audio inputs and outputs. Outputs from the computer will go into usually speakers or headphones, and inputs will be from things like this microphone or from other line inputs like other computer audio devices. The first thing we need to interact between the software and the hardware audio devices is an actual sound card. This is a card that's going to have all the required digital to analog conversion to be able to take the digital sound from the computer and change it to analog sound for headphones or speakers, as well as analog to digital conversion, so that you can take the analog signal coming from this microphone and record, in, record it into a digital audio format. Generally, that digital audio format happens to be PCM, although alternatives such as DSD do exist. Chris Montgomery from ziff.org has an excellent explanation of how PCM works, and I will link it down below. Sound cards also tend to have a bit of additional hardware, you know, stuff like headphone amplifiers so that we can get a decent volume input and preamplifiers so that you can give phantom power up for a microphone or be able to boost the volume to where you need it to be. But in practice, it's basically a way to convert analog audio to and from digital. Next, in the kernel, we need a driver to be able to actually interact with the sound card. It's great that we have this device that can send and receive analog audio, but it's not, it's not much use if we cannot interact with the digital part of it. So the whole point of a device driver in the Linux kernel is to actually be able to interact with the sound card so we can send bytes to it and read bytes from it to be able to like read and write to audio devices. On, in the early days of Linux, this was commonly done with a driver called OSS, which stands for Open Sound System. Unlike the actual name OSS, OSS actually was proprietary for some time. Um, started out as open and then became proprietary, so on and so forth. It also had some limitations. Its replacement, ALSA, is what's in use today. ALSA stands for Advanced Linux Sound Architecture. And it's basically what supports everything from USB sound cards to PCI sound cards to onboard audio on your laptop and desktop. ALSA provides the device drivers necessary to be able to read and write from a sound card. It doesn't provide much more than that. It's just a way to interact with a sound card. Many applications support working with ALSA directly. If I pop open a video in VLC Media Player, it can actually output the audio straight to an ALSA device. Similarly, Audacity can directly record from an ALSA device. In practice, this isn't usually what you do though, because some D6 sound cards don't actually support multiplexing. So while it's great that we can read and write from it, if a program is using ALSA, it'll just take control of the entire sound card, so only one program will be able to play or record audio at a time which in general isn't what you want. You want to be able to have music playing while you play a video, for example, or you want to be able to have two separate like programs running that both want to output or record sound. You know, it would be silly if I had OBS running and also had Teams, except that only one device could use a microphone at a time. But this used to be a real limitation. In fact, many sound cards advertised having support for hardware mixing. Hardware mixing is when you would literally, each program would quite literally send its audio stream to the sound card and the sound card would have the job of taking these and mixing it into a single output that can be sent to speakers or headphones. Now, ALSA is great, it's robust, but that limitation of not being able to multiplex sound cards properly has led to replacements. Well, not replacements, ALSA still remains a driver, but we have abstracted a layer above the uh, device driver. These days, that happens to be Pulse Audio. And more recently, uh, Pipewire is replacing Pulse Audio. But we also have Jack, which was for Pro Audio Systems. Now, both of these are what we call sound servers because the server is going to interact with the sound card and then the programs are the clients. So each of these client programs can output their sound to the Pulse Audio server and then Pulse Audio will take, combine these, do the mixing and output it to the graphics card. Now, this has many benefits, as you might imagine, as well as a couple drawbacks. The benefits are that for no matter what sound card, even one that only supports one in one digital input, I can have 10 programs open that are all playing different songs or different videos. And Pulse Audio will take all of those, resample them, and mix them, and then send them to the sound card. Um, if you're not sure what resampling is, that's a process where that's how many samples per second we have. So for example, audio CDs are traditionally 44.1 kilohertz. So we have 44.1 samples per second. Um, however, digital videos are usually 48 kilohertz. 
and some audio file recordings might be 96 kilohertz. So what happens by default, if your sound card didn't support resampling, you only you want the sound card to only to run at a fixed output, say 48 kilohertz on most modern sound cards. There's no way for the sound card to otherwise take in both a 44.1 and a 48 kilohertz signal without resampling one of them to match the other. And these days, you'll often just take one, anything and resample it to 48. Um, just because it tends to be the most common we see uh, everywhere. Now, fear not, the resampling process, as much as some people claim, distorts the audio signal. It's actually a relatively clean process um, because you can't hear anything about 20 kilohertz anyway. By default, Pulse Audio ships the number of resamplers. Uh, the Speaks ones are used by default for a good balance of CP power to audio quality. And realistically, if no one ever told you, you probably wouldn't have even noticed that it was being resampled. Now, the other good benefit of Pulse Audio is we do can do the reverse. For microphone inputs, the sound card can record the input, send it to Pulse Audio, and then Pulse Audio can distribute this to any program requesting it. Now, this is great because this means that my programs, I can then record the same microphone, say, on both Teams and Skype, or on both like Zoom and OBS. And this way, I don't have to have two physical microphones plugged in. You might have actually noticed this multiplexing in that digital video is still not multiplexed on most computers. This means that if I have a camera and this camera is being used by GovCView so I can monitor it, guess what? I cannot use the same camera on Zoom. I will need two cameras usually. And that's just because while CPUs have gotten fast enough to be able to easily multiplex audio, multiplexing a camera is still a lot of work. Um, Pipewire, which is going to replace Pulse Audio hopefully as soon as possible, does support using GStreamer to multiplex video, but the CPU usage speaks for itself. It's not trivial. Pulse Audio has a few more benefits. For example, if I have two sound cards, most pe pe people that have video cards might have noticed that their HDMI output is technically also a sound output. So if I had a TV connected, I could send sound to my TV. Um, so in that case, you might have two different audio devices, and Pulse Audio e easily provides an API for each program to just send their sound to Pulse Audio, and then we can pick which sound card each one will go to. So I can have music on my headphones, but a movie on the TV, um, so on and so forth. It also lets you individually adjust the volume of each program, which is pretty neat. So you can have the music at a lower volume than the video, for example. Hardware mixing didn't usually support that. If you're on a Linux computer and you're playing audio, chances are it's using Pulse Audio. Now, a competitor to Pulse Audio in the Pro Audio space was Jack. Jack was designed as a virtual, essentially, patch panel, and it's way more flexible than Pulse Audio is, albeit slightly harder to use. So, some drawbacks of Pulse Audio were that it's hard to have a program, say, output the two devices at once, or connect any input, input to any output. Pulse Audio is a very traditional model of here are my inputs, here are my outputs. For example, if I want to split my sound card in two, I need to make a virtual, two virtual sync devices, and then those virtual sync devices will map to a single real output device that will be the sound card, so on and so forth. Uh, it has a lot of these um, steps. There's also a second major disadvantage to it, which is the latency. Pulse Audio usually has latencies of 40 to 80 milliseconds. And if you're trying to run Pro Audio tools, mm, may, that's probably not ideal. Jack stands for uh, Jack Audio Connection Kit, obviously a recursive acronym because yay Linux programs. Um, so Jack is written in C, Jack 2 is the C++ replacement. They are not necessarily compatible, but they kind of do the same thing. The way Jack works is it's very similar to Pulse Audio in that it's a sound server. So all programs will read and write their sound to and from Jack, and then Jack will actually do the interacting with sound cards. Now, unlike Pulse Audio, Jack also supports UART as well as MIDI, MIDI being the important one because it lets, you know, a lot of music pro audio tools work happen to work with MIDI, whether that be MIDI keyboards or... Um, like different lighting controllers you're controlling. MIDI is pretty standard. Uh, musical instrument data, whatever. So Jack is way more flexible than Pulse Audio. I will pop open a Jack graph here so you can see what I mean. Jack is a simple way to connect the output of any program to the input of any other program. As they describe it, it is pretty much like a physical patch panel. If you work at the physical patch panel, you can take outputs from any of these instruments or devices, pop them open to whatever hardware filters you want or um, the analog equivalent of VSTs, take their output, and then you can plug them back in, so on and so forth. You can do any of this mapping where I can start daisy chaining things. Jack kind of lets you do that, where I can have the microphone go into some program and then the output of that can go into some other program. Um, I can split my microphone into multiple programs. I can take all of those inputs and combine them. I can make down mix them into stereo, so on and so forth. Some of the other benefits are it happens to run at a much lower latency than Pulse Audio. 
Jack servers have much shorter delays. They also have the advantage of being able to directly interact more with hardware. So for example, um, higher sampling rates in Pulse Audio tend to be buggy. They work a lot better in Jack because it was designed for Pro Audio by Pro Audio people. So if it's so much better than Pulse Audio, why isn't it used everywhere? Well, it kind of comes down to compatibility. Um, Pulse Audio is just easier to work with. It's simpler and it kind of just works. And for most people, the latency and stuff isn't really not an issue. Realistically, some of the other features offered by Jack, like people don't use MIDI, people aren't don't need to time synchronize all their programs. It is cool though, because if you're a pro audio person, you can have all of these different recording tools and have them all synchronized on the same clock, uh, whether that be their sound card clock or whatever, and have them all record, pause, record into any number of tracks. For example, Ardour, uh, the DAW that I generally use for recording audio, tends to work a lot better with Jack because you can just capture, if I have eight different microphone inputs, I can just capture all eight of them. And the benefit over using it instead of also is that I can still run whatever else I need to run. Now, unfortunately, Pulse Audio and Jack often aren't compatible with each other, just due to how different the different sound servers are. Um, if you want to run both, generally what you have to do is you have to output Pulse Audio as an input in Jack and then go from the output of Jack to your sound card. Uh, this is not uh, optimal for obvious reasons. If I have a program that's playing to Pulse Audio, it's going to have to go program to Pulse Audio, from Pulse Audio to Jack, and then whatever happens to happen in Jack, and then that's going to go to my sound card. Doesn't really help the latency cause there, does it? So Pipewire is going to hopefully be the ultimate replacement for both Jack 2 as well as Pulse Audio. It takes the ease of use and simplicity of Pulse Audio as well as the benefits and advanced feature set of Jack and kind of combines them into some into a pretty good package. I've been using Pulse Audio on my computer for the past four months and it's been working pretty well with the exception of some Bluetooth devices being a bit buggy. I'll touch on Bluetooth at the end of this video because it kind of interacts differently. Um, but Pipewire has been a great replacement. Pipewire offers a drop-in replacement for Pulse Audio, which is the important bit. Um, so any program that used to work with Pulse Audio will work with Pipewire. That's the great news. I can have Firefox, VLC, MPV, whatever. Every program will kind of just, instead of just connecting to the Pulse Audio sound server, it'll connect to the Pipewire sound server. And they have the basically the same Pulse Audio API. So no matter which sound server you happen to be using, both will work in the same way. The benefit of Pipewire though is how it tends to handle inputs. Instead of Pulse Audio's traditional model, Pipewire is, uses a model that's way more reminiscent of Jack to the point where it also is a drop in replacement for Jack programs. So finally, for once in the Linux ecosystem, you can run both Jack and Pulse Audio programs simultaneously, and they can finally interact with each other properly. This is great news because it brings some of the benefits of Jack to Pulse Audio. So this means that now I can use the Jack patch panel approach with the, with the Jack graphs, for example, in many managers to direct my Pulse Audio application. For example, I can finally have the outputs of my sound card split the way I want to, or route any program to any program the way I want to. For example, it makes recording with FFmpeg much easier because I can just easily pick exactly which programs I want to input or output where. It provides that excellent flexibility that Jack used to with the great compatibility of Pulse Audio. Now, by default, you need to use PW-Jack when you're launching a Jack program to use Pipewire instead of the default Jack server. But there is a drop and replacement package on many distributions that will let you directly just run Jack programs using Pipewire server. It is slightly higher latency and I have noticed a bunch of resampling issues. For example, um, if you've note if you have some Jack and Pulse Audio application playing together, you'll notice that one of them because there are issues with the resampling approach being used. I, it's very hard to record that particular uh, artifacting, so I don't think I'll be able to include an example, but it definitely exists. There's definitely some artifacting when going between to and from Pulse Audio and Jack applications. Generally, it has to do with 44 versus 48 kilohertz sampling rate, as well as audio buffers not being long enough because Pulse Audio applications want the bigger buffer, but Jack applications can run off a shorter buffer. There's some issues, but all in all, it's a pretty good drop in replacement, and it kind of takes a spot of both applications. Uh, some stuff, obviously, your config from your Pulse Audio server has to be changed, but honestly, for the added flexibility, I think it's a very good catch. Uh, and Pipewire also has a lot of future potential. Some applications, for example, I recently made a video on how to loop back a microphone input, are so much easier on Jack because you can directly connect the input device straight to your output device, and you don't have to go through all of these other fancy hoops that you had to, with modules being loaded, so on and so forth. Um, and the future potential of Pipewire is even more promising. So right now it's an experimental, but hopefully it's going to become stable by the end of this year or by the time I upload this video. And that is finally, we're going to have the ability to multiplex webcams in the same way that we can multiplex audio. So as I alluded to earlier, just like how we can have multiple programs 
playing audio at the same time, ideally what this is going to allow is for multiple programs to use the webcam at the same time. So I can, as I said, I can have multiple programs use a mic. Why not a camera? Well, Pipewire is implementing this through GStreamer. So any program that's going to support GStreamer will hopefully be able to take in your camera feeds and have it multiplexed. Now, as I said, this kind of is, still, it's still experimental, it's still buggy, it doesn't work in all programs, and it does have a high CPU cost. But it is definitely the way move the future moving forward. Um, now that we have the computational power to do digital video as easily as we can do digital audio. So hopefully this is going to allow for us to be able to reuse our camera in multiple applications at once. All right, before I end this video, I want to do a quick note on Bluetooth because Bluetooth is a mess. Bluetooth is a mess in the same way that, uh, that Firewire was a mess. If you have had to deal with Firewire audio interfaces on Linux, you know what I'm talking about. So modern sound cards, PCI, PCI Express sound cards are all supported by ELSA. Unfortunately, Firewire cards often weren't. So this meant that if you had professional Firewire audio interfaces, you would have to use separate drivers. Um, the Firewire OHCI uh, stack comes to mind. So you'd have to have those to actually interact with the Firewire device, and then you would have to load Jack or whatever audio server you're using on top of that. And often it had to be Jack in those cases. Obviously, this is uh, kind of not ideal. And um, thankfully, Firewire has kind of gone, well, maybe not thankfully, Firewire, it was a neat protocol ahead of its time, perhaps. Um, but since Firewire devices aren't really used anymore, that's not really an issue. What is common these days is Bluetooth. And Bluetooth audio still doesn't always interact properly with ALSA. In many cases, Bluetooth headphones would actually connect directly to the Pulse audio server, not through the ALSA driver. This always has some this always had some couple quirks because Bluetooth headphones can run in a number of modes. SPC, subband codec being the default A2DP sync. You have the HFP and H HSP and HFP headset profiles, which have horrible sound quality but are still needed because it's part of the Bluetooth audio standard. Um, as well as on modern headphones, we now have Aptex, Aptex HD, and AAC audio. So in many cases, these Bluetooth devices have the same problem, where due to the various codecs supported, so on and so forth, um, you know, support kind of varies. Sometimes you need to repair the headset each time. And Pipewire is no better. Unfortunately, I have had more buggy experiences with Bluetooth running on Pipewire than I have with Pulse Audio. And so it's kind of the one last downside for me. I Thankfully, I don't use Bluetooth headphones very often. Uh, I tend to like the reliability of just wired devices and not having to recharge them and the better sound quality as a bonus, I guess. Uh, with Pipewire, there are some issues where, for example, you turn the device on, first time it pairs, but if you turn it off and back on, it won't always connect to the sound server properly. Pipewire will detect it as being there and it'll output audio, but the Bluetooth device doesn't actually receive any audio. Sometimes it works by changing the codec, sometimes it doesn't. It's a bit of a mess. Hopefully by the time I upload this video, some of these issues will be resolved. I know there are many bug reports that are going in weekly uh, onto the uh, GitLab repo for Pipewire, and many of these issues are getting fixed. So hopefully this will just be a short-term hurdle. With that said, thank you so much for watching this very long uh, Turbo Nerd Edition video on Linux audio and how sound servers versus device drivers versus sound cards and how it all kind of works. These videos really aren't meant to be for a mainstream audience. Uh, this is kind of more for people like me where you kind of just get curious about something and you do kind of do a bit of reading or you're kind of just curious about how it works. It kind of just happened to me when I st was stopping and thinking about like how all of this, uh, how audio works at all on Linux. Thank you for watching. If you like this, if you learned something, consider liking the video, consider subscribing to my channel. If there's anything I missed, uh, feel free to leave it in the comments. I'll try to make an errata or a correction in the description and in a pinned comment somewhere. But thanks once again for watching. Have a great day. See you next time. Bye.